I want to go ahead and welcome you and get us started for this evening. Um, thank you so much for coming out again. I'm Erin Anderson. I'm the principal here. It's so great to see so many familiar faces. Many I had a chance to greet at our curriculum night a few weeks ago, and many I have had the, the privilege to partner with you for many years. So um, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, partially for fun and partially it, like real life, I was going to have um, both of my phones on me and my iPad and my... Um, my laptop out here and have them all going off at the same time. I thought that would, God, would that just be hilarious? Yeah, <laughs> like, because that's like sometimes actually my life. But uh, I decided to have it all off and actually most of it up in my office so I could actually attend to what's going on. Um, but this is really an exciting night um, for us. I've had the privilege to hear Dr. Heitner uh, several times um, talking both to the community as well as educators. Um, she has uh, written a text on raising digital natives. Um, I know that you all are raising natives right now on your own. Um, she's going to throw in the digital component. Um, I think her next book is Taming the Natives or something up maybe. Uh, Streamwise, helping kids thrive and survive in the digital world. Uh, but I think what you're going to find is um, not only some helpful information uh, in partnering and really getting connected with your, your sons and daughters in the area of technology and social media and just kind of the new age that we all live in, um, but actually how to have them teach you and, and you to learn with them and perhaps even learn some strategies and ideas um, that will you know, move you in a new direction as well. Um, so I know that she has some wonderful uh, pieces of information for you. And then she will open it up for some questions and answers um, at the end. So um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is awesome to have so many of you here. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Heitner. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. And it's great to have been with some of the other middle schools and also the educators from the middle schools in this district who are awesome, amazing, smart people. So your kids are super lucky. Tell me, how many of you, just by a show of hands, feel kind of envious of kids growing up in the digital age, like all the opportunities, personalized learning, a little bit of connection. Are you feeling envious? Like this would be really cool? Okay. How many of you are feeling a little nervous, like all the opportunities to mess up, global connection for problems, just bigger, more? Okay. I feel both ways, right? I'm very excited about the opportunities that my son and that your children will have. I think this is an amazing time to be a kid. Uh, there's a lot of ways to pursue more esoteric interests. If what you're interested in isn't what the other people right around you are interested in, you can pursue that. There's a lot of ways to, the games are way better. I would definitely play Minecraft over Ms. Pac-Man any day, or even the early Mario Brothers, I know. I know some people are purists and love the classics, but the games are better now. The educational software and interactive opportunities are way better, more immersive, more interesting. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities for our kids also to run into challenges, to be distracted and other things. So I'm going to share with you what I think are some of the key opportunities that we want to help our kids you know, grasp and also how to navigate some of those challenges, right? The distraction, some of the pitfalls around reputation that can come up, um, especially at this age. Middle school is a tough age. It's classically a tough age, right? It's always been tough to be in middle school. It's a transition. You're not really a little kid anymore, but you're definitely not, you know, like a full-grown, even young adult or a big teenager. You know, sometimes our kids act like they're five when they're in middle school. Sometimes we feel like it's like a return to the toddler years. And other times, you know, we're left with a very hormonal middle schooler who wants to date, and it feels like having a much older kid, and you're just like, what? And it could be the same kid, like I could, you know, the, the kid that's acting like the five-year-old but also wants to date could be the same kid or wants to wear makeup or, you know, wants to pursue some kind of older thing. So this is an interesting time, right? Uh, and, and this is also when a lot of kids get personal devices. And so the things I'll share tonight are both relevant to school and personal devices because the kids don't see a bright line between those things. They don't see like, oh, this is my school Chromebook and I'm using that so I'm only thinking about school or this is my personal phone so I'm only thinking about my social life. They might take notes for their homework on their you know, personal phone or on a personal device and they also might be you know, doing a lot of social things or gaming on their Chromebook. Right, so they don't see that line, just like when we're on our work laptop, we might not see that line either. We might send a personal email or buy something from Amazon. We might not think, oh, but it's my work email, unless you have a really, you know, lockdown 
employer, in which case you may not have that option, right? But for many of us, we don't really see those lines between the way we interact with the cloud uh, in terms of personal device or school device or whatever. So, uh, as Ms. Anderson pointed out, I spent the last few years writing this book, right? Super fun, got to talk to a lot of kids, and they tell me things that they don't always tell you. And this would probably be true of my kid, too, if you put him in a room with a researcher, he'd probably be like, blah, 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 blah. And when, he, when I pick him up from school, how was your day? Nothing. What did you learn? Nothing. What did you do? Nothing. Who did you sit with at lunch? Nobody. Right? So I understand. <laughs> How, how, how hard it is sometimes, so some kids are much more chatty, right, when other kids are not, are, are not so revealing about their lives. But when I talk to kids, they tell me a lot of great, interesting things, and they share with me some of the sort of key stresses and key opportunities, the things they love about tech and the things that they don't love. So I study kids in their natural habitat, right? I talk to kids where they are, so I go to their schools. Sometimes I've gotten to do research where I'm talking with families in their homes. And the key areas that are both stressful and also there are opportunities are relationships, reputation, and time management. And these are three areas that we really need to think about with our own relationships with technology, the way we use our phones, computers, other tech, our wearables, right? Anyone got a wearable? That's like the latest thing. All my friends are getting these wearables. I'm like, oh my goodness, our friends are like bionic. They know how many steps they've taken, they know how stressed they are, it's kind of amazing, right? So relationships, reputation, and time management. It's a misconception to think we just don't get this, because in fact there are a lot of experiences that our kids have that are mediated by tech that we do get. This is really quite loud. Can I just go like this? Is that, is that okay? I feel, like, I feel like I should be teaching aerobics. One, two, one. Okay. Uh, so, to feel like I just don't get this, it's very common to feel like you just don't get this. And many of you are techie in your day-to-day -day lives. You may even run social media for your work, or you may be in marketing and doing a lot with interactive technology, or you may be a video game designer personally, but we still don't use tech the way kids use tech. When you text, you're not like, oh, how could I group text everyone I ever met, for example. Like, that doesn't seem fun to you. Most of us don't want to group text with the entire sixth grade, but our kids might think that's a really cool idea. So it's easy to feel like I just don't get this, but in fact, the kids don't know it all. They'll try to say that they do, but they do, in fact, need our guidance, right? And you get more than you think. You get what it's like to be in a conflict with someone that can come up, you know, in a digital space. You understand what it's like to not be invited to a party. You understand what it's like to get distracted, because sometimes when you sit down to do your work, you probably get distracted. So there's a lot more about our kids' experience that we do understand. And what I like to remind parents is that they may have tech savvy, but you have wisdom. You have survived not being invited to something. You have survived having a conflict with someone. Your relationship has gone on. You've repaired those situations or found a way to live with those differences. Right, so a lot of the things that our kids are running into are experiences that we can actually offer them some help with. And I think it's a mistake to feel like you have to have a PhD in Snapchat or Minecraft to be able to mentor a kid in the digital age. There's a lot that's coming up in Minecraft or Snapchat that. You don't need to be super immersed in that app to understand the social uh, component, the thing that may be coming up. Okay, so a big core part of my approach is that we want to think about mentoring our kids more than just monitoring them. And I'm not suggesting there is no place for monitoring, so I've been traveling around with my book and you know, talking to media, and there was an article in the Austin newspaper a few weeks ago in Texas when I spoke there saying, you know, Devorah Heitner, uh, digital citizenship expert, says don't monitor your kids which is not exactly what I said to them. I said, mentoring is more important than monitoring. It's really tempting to think I can put an app on my kid's phone to know where they've been on the internet or know what they're texting, and I'm good, I'm done. Whew. That was so easy, I put the app on their phone. But that's just the beginning, right? First of all, you may or may not want to do that, but secondly, even if you do that, the information and data you are going to get from a sort of a spyware app or a parent's control app is not enough. Your kid could be right now upstairs crying in her room because of something she sees on Snapchat, and the app won't let you know what's going on, even what, what was posted, because it could be so, something totally um, you know, innocuous that's upsetting your kid, but it's not, it wasn't like a harassing message. She might be upset because she saw a picture of other kids hanging out. The app isn't going to tell you about that picture, nor is it going to help you understand why she's upset by it. Uh, the app might give you all your kids' texts, but for most of your kids, it's going to be an extremely boring read. So it's going to be like, hey, what's up? Nothing. What's up? Nothing. Homework? Nothing. 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 Emoji, emoji, emoji. Right? And so 
It's up to you. It is totally your prerogative and right to read your kids' stuff. You are paying for their phones, they live in your house. I'm not here to say that that's not something you could do, but I will suggest that that's not where your job ends, and for some people it may not even be necessary or relevant, right? The most important thing you can do is mentor. You want to be talking to your kids about what's appropriate. Before you would even read your text, you might want to have a conversation with them about what kind of language we can use when we text, or what what do you do in a group text? If your kid doesn't have a phone yet, that's a great conversation. What do you do in a group text if suddenly everybody's talking in a mean way about another kid or a teacher? This is a situation that is pretty much guaranteed to come up sometime in your child's middle school experience, I have to tell you. Uh, and your kid needs to have a plan. Like, what are they going to do when that happens, right? So that's a mentoring conversation. And that's a conversation you can revisit. It might be a different answer in sixth grade than it is in eighth grade. Maybe in sixth grade, your answer is to say, my mom looks at my phone, so you guys need to stop saying mean stuff or I have to bounce. Maybe in eighth grade, you might be like, you guys are being mean, I'm out of here, and you don't need to like, you, you know, appeal to adult authority, right? So those are some kinds of examples of where mentoring is going to be more effective than just monitoring, because you may not even get some of the references. The way kids talk to each other isn't always as obvious as like, I hate this guy, isn't he a jerk? Let's all talk mean about this person. There's all kinds of layers to the way kids communicate. And so sometimes it is that evident, but a lot of times it's not. So monitoring only goes so far. Another thing I'm going to say is if you do choose to monitor, I would let your kids know that you're there. If you are covertly monitoring your kids, then that raises a huge question of what do you do if you see something you don't like? How bad does it have to be before you let them know I saw that and it's not okay with me. Whereas if you are openly monitoring them, at least you can have that conversation. Hey, the language you're using concerns me, and some of those kids' parents probably read these texts too, and they're not going to want you in their house if you know, you're know you talking that way. That's a completely legitimate thing to say to a middle schooler or a high schooler, right? But it's easier to say that if they know you're there. If you're not, if they don't know you're there, at what point, I mean, again, do they have to be planning like a drug heist or you know something really, really terrible before you say, Dude, I'm reading your text. This is not okay, right? And so this is why it's helpful if you are going to monitor it using some kind of technology or just looking at their phone, whatever it is, let them know you're doing it. Let them know what you're looking for and let them know what your plan is for backing off. In other words, sometime between now and when you're dropping them off in Urbana-Champaign or you know Bloomington, Illinois or Madison, Wisconsin or Princeton, New Jersey with a trunk and waving out the back of the Subaru, sometime between now and then you're probably going to stop monitoring. So what are you looking for? What skills are you wanting to see sometime between, you know, sixth or seventh grade and dropping them off, you know, with their trunk and a bunch of bags from Target to decorate their room? You're going to think, be thinking you probably won't be monitoring anymore. So what's, what's that plan? What are you looking to see in terms of independent communication and social skills? And that's the thing. I think we often are kind of just in the moment, and it's hard to think ahead, and it's, I'm sure, hard to look at your sixth or seventh grader and think about that kid you're going to drop off, although some of you maybe have had that already happen with older siblings. That may make it easier to picture. But, like, for me, with a single kid, it's like it's almost impossible for me to imagine, you know, my seven-year-old in that future state. But I have to work backwards from that some of the time. I have to think... If I make him put his plates, at least scrape them and put them in the sink now, he'll be ready to someday be married to somebody and like not have them be appalled and wish and, and regret it later. Right? Like if we can work, you know what I'm saying? So you want to think about this this human being in your house at whatever stage they're at, and like what are the skills we're building? And that's mentoring. Okay, as mentors, we want to teach kids to do the right thing. The other problem with monitoring is it's very focused on catching them doing the wrong thing. Teaching them to do the right, the right thing is a lot more work than catching them do the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. We need to mo model doing the right thing. We need to model that we don't take calls during mealtimes. We need to model that we have some ability to regulate our own tech use. We need to model that we don't text and drive. right? And that's a lot of work, teaching kids to do the right thing. And it also, I have to tell you, even though you're coming to this rel relatively early in the year, there's no guarantee here. I'm not here to say, okay, now you've been to the digital citizenship talk, we're staying on one foot, by the time you're done, we're all good, and your kid will not do the wrong thing. Because it's an ongoing process, and, you're, and middle school is a time of making t 20 million mistakes. It's a time of trying on humor that doesn't work, they may try some outfits and hair that don't work, right? Because this is middle school. So they're going to try a lot of things that don't work, including they're going to make a lot of mistakes in the digital realm. And it's going to be okay in the end, but they're going to work through it. So teaching them to do the right thing doesn't mean that you expect that it's always going to happen. That's just like the goal, the long goal. 
right? And as mentors, we're curious about kids' lives. What is it like to grow up in the age of Google and be able to get so much information that may or may not be developmentally appropriate or, you know, what you need in the moment? You can always get so much data, right? What is it like to have your picture taken all the time by your friends, by your parents? My kid's already been recognized in the street in another city when I was with him at a parade in Minneapolis and someone knew who he was who hadn't met him since he was a baby. It was a family friend, it was not a creepy person, it was not a bad person, but knew my kid for sure could pick him up because of pictures I had shared on Facebook. So these kids are growing up much more public than we are. As mentors, we want to be conscious of our own habits. If you read, but you read mostly digital, if you read on your Nook or your Kindle or your iPad or your phone, like my husband, which is ruining his eyesight, if you read books on digital, make sure your kids know you're reading because they think you're working, you're posting to Facebook, you're texting, right? So let them know you're reading, too. Um, and you, this is a great age for families to read books together. We want to also get think about those other habits that I mentioned, right? Like not texting and driving, showing up on collect meal time. So again, we want to think about how this will all frames out in our relationships. And this could be your kids' peer relationships, his or her relationships with teachers, their relationships with you. All of those relationships get mediated in some ways digitally. The second your kid has a phone, you'll, they'll also be texting you, right? You're thinking about, sometimes we get our kids a phone because we want them to text us. People think, wow, this is going to be really convenient when I'm five minutes late to pick up at soccer practice. I have news for you. Your life is about to get much less convenient because you now have to parent around this phone. So for all the convenience of being able to tell your kid you're five minutes late or they're at the other field because whatever, there's a lot of other work thrown in there. So yes, you will not be getting texts from other 11 and 12 year olds on your phone and that might be a relief, but you have to parent around the device. So anyway, relationships, reputation, time management. So here's some challenges that can come up. Conflicts between friends. Kids can get into conflicts very easily and text is not a great way to get out of them. Kids can get into conflicts because the tone isn't there, right? When I text you, where were you at lunch? It can sound like an accusation. Where were you at lunch? Right? And I might hear it as an accusation, and then I might be stressed out, then I might answer from my stressed out place, and suddenly we're having a fight, and I just want to have lunch with you. So that's what happens, right? And sometimes it's more intentional. Sometimes I actually don't like you, and I want to make you feel bad, but then when you say I'm being mean, I might be like, JK, I didn't really mean your outfit was ugly. I was just, JK, JK, it's just kidding, just kidding, right? So there's a lot of nuance to texting. Um, but a lot of times things can go haywire in a text, even between kids who basically do like each other and get along. And this is why we want to teach our kids to go face to face as much as possible, especially if something has gone wrong, to be able to go to a friend and say, you know, hey, we need to talk about this, or is there something we need to talk about, or are you okay, did I hurt your feelings, right? Or even, um, as I was, I was speaking last night at a high school, one of the high school kids said, or just go up to someone later and say, hey, are you ready to say that to my face, which is a little more assertive, but I think there are situations where even saying that, which sounds almost aggressive, could actually take the situation down, right? Where someone was saying things and talking bigger and bigger via text, and if, if they were actually faced with a friend saying, are you gonna say that to my face? They might actually be like, oh, no, right? And like, just shh. So that's what you want. Texting is not a great way to solve conflicts. And if you get into a conflict with your child via text, I would also suggest saying, let's talk about this in person. You do not want to be texting angry at your kiddo either and have them look at it later. A bunch of sixth graders I worked with came up with an app for this. It's the Sparkle Chat, are you sure you want to send that app? Um, if you watch my TEDx, I talk a little bit more about this app process that I do with kids to help them think through problems with, with, with technology. But this is really great. We should all have the Sparkle Chat, are you sure you want to send that app on our phone? But failing that, we can just use our brains and put on the Empathy app, and before we send something, we should think about it. Am I sure I want to send this? Right? Many problems could be alleviated if everyone took a moment to think, am I sure I want to send it? Okay, we want kids to find some clarity through boundaries. Boundaries are so helpful in the digital age. The, the, the digital age takes away a lot of our boundaries because we have our personal tech with us. People can reach us at all times, whether it's our mother-in-law, our employer. So we need to think about boundaries. We need to think about, huh, if I'm going to email the teacher, first of all, could I get this information another way? Is it on the learning management system? Could I get it from a friend before I reach out to the teacher? And then if I'm going to email the teacher, what's the salutation that I should use if I'm a middle schooler emailing my teacher? And then I should think about, huh, what kind of time should I be emailing the teacher? And if I email the teacher, choose to email the teacher late at night, what would be a reasonable response time? And if I email the teacher at 11 p.m., would it be reasonable to expect a response at 11.15 p.m.? Probably not, right? But a lot of times we're not thinking about those boundaries. 
just like we may have different rules than our friends, and so it's helpful if you have a rule in your house about when kids can be tech connected, texting, on games, it may be helpful for them to let their friends know, hey, I can't text after nine. And you might think, well, my kid won't say that, they'll be embarrassed. It's actually a relief for kids to be able to tell their friends what the boundaries are and be able to assert that, because then they don't feel like they're being a bad friend. When their friends get that do not disturb message, right, or that they can see that they're not accessible or they just don't hear back, they're not wondering, because you know what? Your kid already told them, I don't text after nine, right? Or I don't text when I'm doing my homework. I've had a lot of parents ask me, someone asked me last night, what do I do when kids are texting my kid when he's trying to do homework? Definitely you want to use tech to, to block that. You can go with a do not disturb. Now, you can also say to your friends, hey, when I'm doing homework, I can't be responsive. But some friends have a harder time observing those boundaries. So you want your child to get practice having good boundaries themselves, not calling other people at times that most of us hope that kids are sleeping, not uh, if people you know, don't respond right away, being sure that we don't become this person, right? Many kids, the second they get a phone, get real impatient if they don't hear back from someone right away, so they text again and again and again. We need to teach our kids that that's annoying. I did ask a group of kids recently if they found this annoying, and I was expecting them to say yes. You know when you're a speaker, like you kind of do it a few times, then people say the same thing, and you're like, you feel like you know the answer? And they were like, no, that makes me feel really cool, like they really want to be my friend. And I was like, oh gosh, guys, you're supposed to say, it's annoying, it's bad boundaries. I still think we want to teach our kids not to do this, despite the fact that one group of seventh graders told me it made them feel really cool and in demand when they come back to their phone with 90 text. It's not going to be great in the workplace. It's not going to be great if they do this with their teachers, right? This, this, this is pretty much annoying, except for that one group of kids who thought it was cool. Okay, our kids have a digital footprint from a young age, and we are part of that. Just like I created the digital footprint for my kid, and then he was recognized in the street of Minneapolis, many of you have shared images of your kids. If you share images of your kids, even before middle schools, by upper elementary school, we should be asking permission. But certainly by middle school, we should be sensitive to our kids' privacy. We should be asking permission. We also shouldn't post personal stuff about our kids on our social media. Now, this is tricky because as a parent, I go through a lot of things you know, that are emotional for me that relate to my kid. So at what point do I not want to share about him? Right? And this is, I, I navigate this really interesting. And as a parent of a kid with special needs, I feel like it's really important that I think about his privacy, right? Because he may choose or not choose to disclose some of that. So, like, I'm on a listserv for parents with special needs where I talk really openly about this stuff, but it's a private listserv. Um, but in public, on Facebook, I don't talk about a lot of that stuff. So I think about those things in different ways than maybe some people. Um, everyone's going to do different things. Many of us are sharing lots of pictures of our kids, but ask them, and you will be surprised how relieved they are that you're asking permission. A lot of parents are like, oh, my kid doesn't care, but then they start asking and they're like, oh, my kid really likes that I'm asking. She feels really respected. She really appreciates having veto power. We want our kids to learn it's okay to say no because consent is really important in the digital age and we want them to be able to say no to peers if they're taking their picture. We want them to feel safe at school and we want them to be able to ask their friends before they take and share a picture. They don't need a three-page release form if people are going like this and acting like they're happy to be in the picture, then it's okay, but if you're going to also share it, it's a good thing to also say, hey, is it cool if I put this on Instagram? Right, just tack that on there. Uh, if kids are saying no and putting their hand up and trying to grab your phone, that's saying no, right? And a lot of times kids don't respect that boundary, so it's really, really clear and important that kids know that they shouldn't take other people's pictures and share them without permission. For some kids, it's quite stressful having their picture taken all the time, and other kids are like, it's, it's fine. Birthday parties is something to think about. When our kids are little, we, we have birthday parties and maybe we share them on social media. As our kids get older, they might have parties, graduation parties, other things. We may, you know, bar and bat mitzvahs. We may not want to share all of that on social media. We may want to think twice about that. And we should start talking to kids about people feeling left out um, and just considering that. Now, the flip side is your kids will see things where they feel left out, just like you will, just like I do. We all do. And that's part of living in a social media time. We can't teach our kids that it's a catastrophe. Because they're going to see pictures every day of people doing something without them. So we can't teach them, like, this is horrible, this is terrible, how could somebody do this? What we want to do instead is say, we try our best not to intentionally post things where we know people are going to feel bad. And then we need to have a thick skin about it. We need to remember that we're here now. And if your child is sitting home with you on a Saturday night and seeing a slumber party unfold and watching it and obsessing, that's a good time to distract them. That's a good time for them to put their phone away. That's a good time to offer the ice cream and the Netflix. And you know, you may be their big plan for the night, but it's okay. 
We can, as, as once your children are teenagers, you have to really embrace the B clan. But even at 11 and 12, you may already be the B clan, depending on how like cool your kid is. And if they're trying to be super cool, just embrace that B clan. Like, hey, they're home. They're wanting to hang out with you. Maybe there was something else going on that they should not be sitting and looking at that something else and obsessing. That is not a healthy way to spend a Saturday night or any time. That can make you feel real bad. So every day is picture day, as I said. Our kids are growing up constantly being photographed. I would only be concerned about this if your child is obsessed with getting likes, you know, really worried, photoshopping their image to change how they look. I would be concerned. Um, taking down images the second they put them up if they don't get likes right away would be concerning. Just the fact of sharing lots of selfies is pretty typical for boys and girls, for some kids, right? Not every kid is doing this, but for kids who are doing it, just the fact of taking lots of selfies with your friends or on your own is not in and of itself a concern to me. It does not mean your kid is a narcissist. It just means your kid is into taking selfies. A lot of kids are. The technology makes it really easy. It's a way for kids to remember who they were with, what they were doing. Maybe it is also, you know, my hair looks cute today, but a lot of it is like, just this is what I was doing, and it's a visual record. But again, if your child seems a little too hung up on getting likes, on getting responses, getting followers, people he or she doesn't know, then I would be more concerned. But every day being picture day is kind of part of their world. So the more safe they feel, the more they feel like they don't, that they can say no to you or anyone else sharing their picture, and they would not, would not feel coerced into sharing pictures if someone was demanding a picture of them, which can happen, unfortunately, then that's a really good set of boundaries for them. Okay. So sometimes we worry about naughty pictures, kids taking sexy pictures, underwear pictures, you know, trying to look more adult. Um, may not happen in middle school. You kind of hope it doesn't, but it does sometimes. I'm not saying just here, but like in general, I hear from middle school. So this is something to proactively talk to kids about at this age, even if you think there's no way my kid would ever do this, to at least start the conversation to say, no one has a right to demand pictures of you. Right, like as a condition of being in a relationship or anything like that, just, it's, you know, this is a good boundary to have. And just to remind them, pictures can get out there in ways that you can't anticipate. Right, so those are two good reminders. You don't need to go really far down this road talking to kids unless it's come up. If it comes up in their peer group and somebody has done this and the picture is circulated and everybody's talking about it, then I would also talk about how to have some grace and let that person not be sitting alone at the lunch table for the rest of their lives. Right, that people make mistakes, but we can't turn them into pariahs for those mistakes. It's very important that kids in middle school or even high school can't like shouldn't fall off the cliff when they make a digital mistake. And sexting is one of those mistakes where where we feel so icked out that it's almost like we see that person's parents, you know, in the grocery store and one across the other side. Don't be so fast, right? Everyone does some dumb things. This is just one of the dumb things that like freaks us out the most. It's just a dumb thing. Right? It's not a good idea. We don't want our kids to do it, but it doesn't mean they're a horrible person or that they're going to come to a bad end or any of that of those things. And it's honestly the kind of thing that, again, some of us would have done the same dumb stuff that these kids are doing if we had the technology, just like the selfies all the time. So really, we want to be both teaching our kids not to do this, but also sympathetic when it happens. And that's a hard one. I think a lot of us as adults are so icked out by this that we're just like, <sighs> right? So just have that conversation with kids. But we do want to have that conversation. Same thing with pornography. We think, oh, pornography. I don't want to talk to my kid about that. Well, when I'm with third graders, I ask them always, like, hey, guys, raise your hand if you've seen a site that's not for kids. And they all raise their hand. So if you don't think your middle schooler has ever seen a site that's not for kids on the internet, maybe that's true. That's a possibility. But it's highly unlikely. <laughs> highly unlikely. And it may not be porn. It may be something else icky that we don't want them to see. But just know, kids know that this stuff is out there, so it's actually better for us to talk to them. It's better for us to go to them and say, I, this is a really good book that I took that is in line with our family's values that will teach you things about how your body is changing than to let them Google it. We don't want kids Googling the answers to life big questions. Money is another big question. I was just with my friend Ron Lieber who wrote a great book, The Opposite of Spoiled, and he talks about how kids will look up like our salaries or how much our house is worth at this age. So it's something, again, to think about, like, all of the things that we, our parents, wouldn't sh would shut us down and say, that's not for you, your kids can Google it. Every single thing that your parents were like, that's not for you, you don't need to know about that yet, you know, we're going to talk, you know, my parents would go in the other room and they would like talk in Yiddish or they would be like, I'm not going to tell you that or that's not for you and I'd pick up on the other end of the receiver to try to know and, you know, and then they'd hang up the phone or they'd say, Deborah, I hear you. 
Your kids can Google it. Okay. We want to think about mobility. We want to think about what it's like to be in a house where you can get as far away from the parents. Right? What does it mean? Or what does it mean that your kid is on the way to school, on the bus, or in the back seat of your car on a device? Right? So just think about your house and think about how can you curate the environment. Just because the Chromebooks are for school doesn't mean they need to live in your child's room at night. And I would really think carefully about with a middle schooler, even if they go there to do homework, maybe that's the only quiet space for them to go to do homework, should they then come back out before your child goes to bed? Sleep is so crucial in middle school. If you can do one thing in middle school to help your child have a happy life and be, you know, feel good, it's making sure they get enough sleep. This is a crucial, crucial thing. And so having a connecting device in your room overnight and getting enough sleep for most middle schoolers don't go that well together. So really think about it. It is truly up to you if you want their phone or their Chromebook to be in their room overnight. But really think about do the benefits outweigh the, the downsides or you know, do the downsides outweigh the benefits. Kids get distracted. A lot of you said this when I went around to check in with families when, uh, when you all first arrived. Distraction is real. We don't want our kids to feel like they have morally failed when they get distracted. How many of you sit down to do your work on the computer and sometimes get distracted? Anyone? Yeah, this happens to me too, right? I'm thinking, well, I'll just check Pinterest for a minute. I'll just check Twitter for a minute. Right? And then half an hour, an hour goes by. I would still be writing screen-wise if I hadn't turned off the Wi-Fi every day and written a thousand words before I would check anything, even my email. They were like, even your email? Yeah, even my email. So that's what worked for me. I wouldn't have finished the book otherwise because there's always one more thing. There's always one more thing to research. There's always one more idea. But you can write down those questions, and we can teach our kids this technique. Write down those questions, and then do all your internet searches at the same time. If you're working on a bigger project, and you're doing research, you don't have to research and go down that rabbit hole every five minutes. You can actually write down a list of questions and then do all your research. Right, so these are some techniques we want to teach kids. We can teach kids how to use tech to fight tech. So I just wrote a blog post about distraction on my Raising Digital Natives website. And like, tech to fight tech sounds kind of weird, but I think turning off the Wi-Fi is kind of using tech to fight tech. You can also use productivity apps like Freedom or LeechBlog to block certain apps. For me, for a long time, Realtor.com and all the real estate apps were a problem, so I've turned those off. I was years ago in an academic job search, so I was always looking at different towns and thinking like, what would my kitchen be like if we lived in Tacoma? What would it be like in another town? Hmm, this is a nice house. So that was a big rabbit hole for me. It was worse than social media, actually. It really was. Like, I can only stand social media for a certain amount of time, but I had really an endless appetite for houses. So we all have something, right? We all have something that just we could really look at for a long time. And so kids are like that, too. They are not worse than we are necessarily, they're really just the same, they have, you know, maybe maybe their young brains are less developed, but there's a lot of things that we actually do that, that they're doing too, so we need to be sympathetic to that distraction. Some of them may need to do homework in a public place. I would also get from your kid's team, you know, the, t the, the, the grade level expectations for homework. So I know they have more than one teacher in middle school, but find out what is the grade level expectations for homework. It's not four hours. So if your kid is taking four hours, there's a problem. They're getting distracted. Something's happening. If they're saying they have to stay up late, middle school isn't designed to make kids stay up late. Your kid is not supposed to be up till midnight doing homework. So something is wrong if your kid is staying up late, homework is taking hours and hours and hours. So fact check that with their teachers. Fact check that with their counselor. And then come back to them with the data. And for some kids, that B minus that they get when you make them unplug, even though they say they're still doing homework, will be a consequence that will actually help them get it right. And I know we don't want our kids to have troubles with grades and stuff, and it feels like, oh my goodness, that's terrible. But I'm telling you, I got a couple C's in middle school, and I still got a PhD from Northwestern, and I was a professor for a while, and it's really okay. I mean, and I was also late every day of seventh grade, which my dad still likes to bring up every once in a while. Um, social media. Our kids are using social media. Raise your hand if your kids are on Snapchat. Okay, raise your hand if they're on Instagram, Musical.ly. Okay, so these are some of the hot apps for kids right now. There are also for adults, adults are on these apps too. A lot of 20-somethings and even older people are on Instagram. Some of us are on Instagram. Snapchat is super popular with college kids and, and some older people. But the kids aren't using them in different ways than we do. And Snapchat you know, had kind of a naughty reputation for a while because the whole idea of the disappearing photo, right? And, oh, we're gonna, you know, people will take a naughty photo. People are doing totally innocuous stuff on Snapchat. And they're doing totally, you know, could you could do something really bad on Instagram or on Facebook. So, 
I'm really app agnostic when it comes to kids and social media. There's not really good apps and bad apps. Parents would like there to be good apps and bad apps because that would make our lives easier. The only exception I would make is any app that encourages kids to interact anonymously is usually a cesspool of negative, yucky stuff, right? Any app where kids are hanging out and being anonymous is usually not good. Um, when your child wants an app, they should have your permission. Certainly if your child is under 13, which is the age for most of these apps, they should have your permission. And you want to think about what the criteria is for them to be connected to someone. So if you have a new phone user and they want an app and they're under 13 and you're going to give them permission to do that anyway, talk about the criteria. Who can you be connected with in this space? Does it have to be someone I, your parents, know? Does it have to be someone you personally know? A lot of kids will say yes to any followers because they think it's rude to say no. We need to clarify. That's a boundary of the digital age. We need to clarify. No, it's totally fine for you to say no. In fact, I expect you to say no. Musical.ly is an app where you find like second graders have you know middle-aged men following them. Something is wrong with that picture. If you look at your second graders' Musical.ly account and you see grown-up followers that are not in your family, you're like whoa, right? But that's happening. So we really have to look at who's following our kids. Why are they doing that? Why are kids saying yes? Or are their accounts public so they don't even know who's following them? So social media, it can be a really fun place for kids. It's a place for them to hang out that you don't have to drive them to, so that's always nice. Right? You probably do enough driving them around. It's going to intensify whatever else is going on. If your kid is a social butterfly, it's going to turn up the dial on that. If your kid is already feeling a little isolated, it may turn up the, the volume on that. Right? So you have to look at what's already going on socially with your child, and being on social media probably won't change that, but it may make it more intense. You want to look at the settings with them, and if you are going to get an, uh, an account in that app, have them help you set that up. So this is Instagram, and here I'm looking at photos are private versus public, and also geotagging. Do you want your child leaving a, a chain of, of geotags wherever they go? Probably not. Probably not, right? But you want to look at that because otherwise, their pictures are going to be geotagged in public, right? So really look at those settings. And the reason I don't spend an hour with people going over these settings is they're going to change in five minutes. So unfortunately, this is a moving target. In fact, Instagram may not look exactly like this because this slide is a couple months old. So just keep, keep up with it and also have your kids keep up with it. Talk to them about why social media wants our data. Talk to them about advertising. If they are getting ads on their Instagram, talk to them about, hey, how did they know you liked Converse sneakers? Huh, that's pretty interesting, right? That's pretty interesting. Some kids at this age revel in skepticism and love to think about how can I be like skeptical about the man or corporate. That's a great thing to encourage when your kids are getting on social media, because you should be thinking about that stuff, frankly. And as a Gen Xer, I'm like, oh yeah, think about that. But most of these kids are like, this is kind of cool because they know what I like, so they're going to advertise to me the stuff that I like. They're not very skeptical, many of them. And I, I would even want to encourage a little more skepticism. Okay. A crucial skill of the digital age is repair. Our kids are going to mess up. They are going to send that joke on the group text that their friends don't like. They are going to respond to one person and not the other, and the other friend is going to see the response and be like, dude, you said you weren't available, but I saw that you were playing the game with the other person in the public server. What do you mean you weren't available, right? There's a lot that can happen um, that kids will need to repair. Kids may send an email to the teacher, and the teacher's like, try that again like I'm your teacher. They're going to get it right the next time, right? So the good thing, again, is that middle school, we're, we're very forgiving. We know they're young. They're in development. They're changing all the time. We give them lots of chances to get it right. So that's really good. The other thing is parents worry a lot about you know, college and career in terms of reputation, but middle school's still pretty far from that. So there's not really much you can do in you know, sixth grade that means you can't you know, go to college and have a career. So I wouldn't worry too much about those far future things. I'd focus more on the present, like how do you repair if you do offend your teacher or your parent or your grandmother or your friend in that moment. And get them to really think of ideas you can co-create solutions. When do you need to go to a friend in person and apologize even if the mistake or the conflict happened in the digital realm? That's a really important thing for kids to know. If you have examples where you've repaired a gaffe, you did the reply all. You sent an email when you were angry, and we've all done it. Think about sharing that story with your child. Our kids know a lot less about our communication because we're not on the phone in the kitchen anymore. And I think it's really helpful for them to see how we've maybe repaired a problem or a mistake. Ooh, I wasn't supposed to share that news. But I did, and this is what I had to do to kind of try to make it right. Again, most of us have made that mistake, sharing something that we thought was already public. Turns out maybe it wasn't so public yet. Oops. Right? So that's a conversation to have with our kids. 
Family life in the digital age sometimes looks like this, and I love this picture because the kid is reading a book and the adult is on the phone. Um, sometimes we're alone together. Sherry Turkle, who's a researcher at MIT, talks about that, that idea of alone together time, where I'm out to breakfast with you and we're both on our phones and we're alone together, right? So think about looking around at your family and thinking how much of that time is alone together time. Because some of that time probably is, is good and fine and gives us all the break that we need from one another in family life, and especially with teenagers. Sometimes we need to be a little bit like, I need a break. I need to read my Chicago Tribune or my New York Times and just kind of, mm, that space, right? But if that's all of our time, if all of our time looks like this and we're all up in our own media, you know, having a separate experience, then we may want to think about what can I do to change that? What can I do to interrupt that? What can I do to bring us together? Maybe even share time looking at the same screen. So I'm not even saying it always has to be not screen time. Some of it you may want to unplug. But maybe it's like, could we compromise on a family movie instead of all four of us kind of, you know, focusing on our own media, right? What does that look like? So. Let me summarize and then I would love to take questions. So as I mentioned, we want to mentor more than we monitor. It's an ongoing process. It's talking to them about what they're getting right, helping them figure out how to repair when they get it wrong. Monitoring is strictly you know, up to you. The school has certain ways of knowing where kids have been. It's good for them to know that. You certainly have ways of knowing where they've been. I think if you're using those ways, it's good for them to know that. But ultimately, we want to mention them. We want them to come to us when they have problems as well, and it's good to let them know that even if they have broken the rules, they can still come to us. We're still there for them, right? Like if my kid gets on an app that I told him he couldn't get, I might be disappointed or upset, but if someone's harassing him in that app, I'm gonna help them out. I'm gonna keep my kids safe. That's the most important thing. So we need our kids to know that ultimately we're there for them, even if they've broken the rules, even if they've done something they wish they hadn't done, that you wish they hadn't done, you're still there for them. That's an important message. Boundaries are clarity. Being able to say to friends, I don't text after 9, or I can't game that late, or whatever, or I'm not allowed to play that game, or my family doesn't want me looking at websites like that, or that's against my religion, or I'm uncomfortable with that. Those are all great boundaries for kids to say. Or, no way am I going to send you a picture like that. That's a good boundary. It's good for kids to cultivate those boundaries. We need our kids to be able to work it out face to face. We need to, to be able to say, I'm sorry. My tone wasn't so great there, let's talk about it. And finally, we as, as parents want to model being here now, being present, not being alone together, but actually being connected with our kids. It may be that we think that we're always looking at the top of their heads, but they may feel the same way, that they're looking at the top of our head as we're in our tech. And I know in my family, I have to check in with this all the time because it's so easy, right? Raising digital natives is my own little business. All I can do, you know, all the time, I could be looking every day at my Google Analytics all day. Right? How many people went to my website today? But when my kid comes home, I need to get interested in him. And sometimes he doesn't seem that interested in me, but I still need to create that space for him to get interested or for him to see that I'm interested or for me to be able to have that moment of interaction. And if I'm always looking down, we're not going to have that moment of interaction. Right? So we have to balance. And it's hard. Right? The 21st, work to, 21st century workplace knows where we are. Right? Your boss can email you at any time, so you know, we can do things to push back. If you're in a leadership position at work, you can tell your team, hey, we don't email at night, or whatever you want to do. We need to take active steps as adults to create a culture so that our kids are in the 24-7 workplace. This is one of the biggest sources of stress for people in our generation, is that 24-7 workplace, and maybe we want to change that culture a little bit and move back to you know, a more kind of 9 to 5, a more bounded workplace. My parents didn't hear from their employers at night. They did not hear from their employers at night. So something's changed. Something's really changed. And we, we need to really think about what was good and bad about the old days, because I'm not idealizing the old days. I don't think everything was great, right? But I also think that was kind of nice for me that my parents weren't hearing from their employers at night. So OK, let's move on to questions. And if you ever want to visit my website, it's raisingdigitalnatives.com. And I'll just say my book, screen-wise, it's at Anderson's and at Barnes & Noble in Naperville. And you guys are so lucky to have an awesome independent bookstore right here in your community. They are super nice. Even if you don't get my book, you should all go to Anderson's with your kids and get them something. Get them a young adult novel. I went in there last week to sign my book, and I was like, these people are the best. I would like drive to Naperville from Evanston, where I live, to go to this bookstore. So go there. Um, OK, questions, thoughts, ideas? Everyone's like, she really scared me with that cupcake photo. Why did she show me that? <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Hopefully it won't happen to you.
don't think your kids aren't hearing about the election. I guess that's another thing I'll just say. Like, don't think, I mean, even if they didn't watch the debate, maybe they did, but that's another situation where there's a lot of in uncivil conversation, uncivil talk going on in our culture right now. People are not being that nice. Um, we can talk about that as a counterexample. We want our kids to be nicer. We want them to be more civil. And unfortunately, the election isn't the best example of some of that going on. But have, have that conversation with them, and especially if they're hearing about it, if they're concerned about it. I think we need to expect that our kids are seeing things in the media, and we should be, should be engaging with them about that, and as opposed to, again, going with the approach that our parents may have taken of, like, I'm going to change the channel. So I have two boys, 13 and 11. Now, some of the things that my 13 boy, the old boy knows, but my mom might like we don't we don't think it's appropriate for the younger, yeah. younger son. But if I said, say you go to the other room while I talk to you know my older son or and or, I mean, how is that conversation going to work? Because my younger son is going to be like he's going to be like. Listen. So how does that conversation go so that you're not alienated, but at the same time, there are certain things that are not appropriate for yeah. for Yeah. Well, I think in any family, like if you have kids who are older, who maybe you're okay with them playing a certain kind of violent game, but you don't want the five-year-old seeing the game or something that's going to give them bad dreams. Um, you know, try the car if you if the older one like has a certain thing that you drive to. That's like a good one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, it's, I mean, it depends on, on, on the conversation or if, you know, since, you know, you may be able to, like, think about when the younger one has a play date. But I think it's great to talk to our kids individually about this stuff, not just because of their age differences, but because there are things they may not want their siblings to know if they go to school with their siblings or anything else. Um, if kids are having problems at school or problems socially, they're not necessarily going to talk about it in front of the siblings. So I think there are many reasons why we want some alone time with each kid. And, you know, the bigger your family, the more challenging that is, but we, there's always that moment to grab it. Um, you may even have to plan, so use that online scheduler. If your kid's got the Google Calendar, you could schedule time and be like, all right, this is our time. We're going out for ice cream. Let's talk. Calendaring is another great skill. We don't want to talk about calendaring, but calendaring could be like this thing that saves your child from themselves. What's the um, value of not giving your child a device? Well, I think or not in social media. Like kids can phone. last pretty long without a phone if they have another way to text. I think it gets harder and harder for them to make social plans without texting past a certain age because their friends will be texting. I think if you're willing to let their friends text you, but you, I think we we have to allow that in middle school, um, certainly by seventh and eighth grade, that many 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 kids are texting. And so as a parent, like if you're willing to get those texts and share them with your kid when their their friends are trying to make plans. If you're lucky enough, and hopefully in middle school this is still a case where you know the parents of your child's inner circle, they're good friends, it's also good to let them know, like, hey, if y'all are going to do this cool thing, remember, mine doesn't have a phone, but you can text me. Like, you don't want your kid to not get invited to do the thing just because they don't have the phone, but because there's so many devices where they can text that are not phones, many of them are able to keep up pretty well. And voice calls are honestly, like, not the thing that your kid really wants, probably. Most kids are scared to make them. They don't know what to do if they get called. We want to teach them that skill, but in the meantime, most of them, you know, it's, so it's not about the phone. I mean, the phone may be a status symbol in this community, like it is in many communities, like having a certain phone, it could be a status thing. But the, the thing that they mostly want is to be able to text. Well, what is, it, is there any research for parents that choose not to? I read that to American Girls and social media, and yeah, didn't they have, I, that is a scary book that Nancy yeah. just said. I'm going to meet her. We're both speaking at the same conference more. in February, so I'm excited to meet her. I would say, like, ScreenWise is like the optimist <laughs> book. I mean, yes, there are people doing icky things, and there are people, again, that's why you want your kids to have boundaries, because there are people who will try to coerce you into sending a picture or doing other things. Um, that doesn't mean that's going to happen to your kid, or it doesn't mean that they would do it, though. I mean, I think that we need to be really clear that. That, that, that book, I mean, it's good to know the worst case scenarios, but that's not necessarily what's happening in your kid's world. Ask them what the worst case scenario is. They'll probably tell you. They might be like, yeah, kids got really mean on Minecraft last week, so I'm taking a break. Or, you know, so-and-so posted a picture of me and I really hated how my hair looked. I mean, they will tell you if you ask them or if you get them all talking. One thing I like to do with 6th, 7th, and 8th graders is get them to redesign the apps. I'll be like, so how would you change Snapchat? 
and they will talk about, well, actually, I would make it really disappear instead of like the things that it actually does where you can screenshot. I mean, they get it. They have good critiques. So I would try to get your child to give you know, his or her discernment about the things they see other people doing. That'll give you a sense of their, of their judgment. Um, I agree with you that kids are getting phones quite young. And when I hear kids talk about when I go on a play date, the other kids are on their phones, and that's really annoying. And I'm like, is a child who still calls hanging out with him or her friends a play date but also has a smartphone that is newer than my smartphone is a child with a, like a kind of a dissonant situation because what we're doing is we're we're like making their play dates happen and cultivating their social lives and then we're giving them this really huge thing that does a lot of stuff and saying okay now you make your own social life happen but there's no kind of like training wheels for that they're just we're just kind of throwing them over the cliff and that's really hard so if you're lucky enough to live in a neighborhood where your kid is knocking on doors and getting kids to come out and working some stuff out on the block that's great, because that's better training wheels for having your own phone than just like, oh, it's Saturday, and mommy has arranged a play date for you, you lucky child, and suddenly I'm going to hand you a phone and be like, you do it yourself. You have zero skills in plan making, zero skills in expectation management in your friendships, right? Nothing. And now you have this thing where you can see the entire internet, you can text everybody, you can text everyone in your grade, right? So it's a big <laughs> Um, the one good thing about the real little guys getting these phones is that they're still young enough to be like, my mom says I can't say mean things on here. Whereas when ninth grade was the time when everyone got a phone, by the, when you're 15, you're not going to do that. You're not going to be like, we can't be mean here because my mom says that's not okay. Right? A fifth grader will do that. Is it worth getting your fifth grader a phone? That's between you and me. I don't, I don't think... 10-year-olds aren't necessarily ready, but there are a lot of 13-year-olds that aren't ready that have phones. So we got to figure out what to do with that, right? Then we got to figure out what to do. If your kid is impulsive, if they're struggling socially, handing them a phone is not going to make their life easier. Um, Want to be in an ongoing conversation again? Does it need to live in their room? There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, of room between um, nothing and 24/7 access to everything. Yeah. I was just going to say that in our family we started with iPods like three years ago and because with the iPod Touch it, they still have access um, to the online stuff as long as they're in a the Wi-Fi zone and they can text. The only thing they can't do is group text because that creates other weirdness. Although some of them can get the like, apps like Kick. Yeah, really it was kind of, well, yeah, we all like Kick. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it, it was kind of a good training wheels situation and then we got up with these dumb phones and they are the only eighth graders on apparently on the face of the planet you know, <laughs> dumb phones and, so yeah. and it's hard to find now it's getting harder and harder to even get like your your flip phone yeah is there a resource that you could share that kind of lists like from a mom's or a dad's perspective of what's a good app and what's a bad app because I'll, i feel like i'm tech savvy and you've listed off all these these apps that i've never even heard of okay I, I really think there's no good apps and bad apps again, but I will say that um, commonsensemedia.org is a nonprofit. Parents can submit both movie reviews, game reviews, and app reviews. They are always a little bit more conservative than I would be. The head of that organization was like, kids shouldn't be on social media until they're 15. Well, the reality is lots of kids are on social media way before they're 15. So they're conservative, but you can read what, their ki what the parents say and even what kids say about certain apps and games, and that's really helpful. Especially, like in my family, I might feel really different about a movie that has language than a movie that has violence. So I don't want to just know that it's PG-13. I actually want to know what's in that movie that makes it PG-13 or R, because there might be an R-rated movie, honestly, that I would see with my seven-year-old, and there might be a PG-13 rated movie that I think is too violent for my seven-year-old, right? Or a PG movie, even, so that it's too scary for some little kids. So it's actually really helpful to know what's the content and what, and then you can kind of mesh that with like your family values and your kids' sensitivity and decide. Um, so that is really a helpful, commonsensemedia.org. My blog at RaisingDigitalNatives.com is not an app by app. I do talk about Minecraft. I have a resource round up on Minecraft. Hmm. I blog about Pokemon Go this summer. So I, but I'm just one person. Common sense is like huge. So that's really helpful. There was an app that was going around, I guess, a lot of the junior high and high schools, and it's a calendar, a calculator app, mm -hmm. and it was actually a way for kids to hide pictures yeah. inside, right. and it looked like an app on the front, and you put a certain code, and all of a sudden all these sexting pictures would show up. I would argue, though, that it's better to be in conversation with our kid about that stuff, because they're, they are going, I mean, 
The fact that they know to hide certain things in some ways is a cultural literacy. Like the fact that they know that they can use different language, maybe when they're texting with friends and they would use it like church or synagogue or at the table with their grandparents, is actually, we do want them to know. Just like we know when we can swear or not swear, right? Like I know when I can use certain words and most of the time I can't anymore, right? But like back when I was in college, maybe I had that bad language that I used all the time and now like 99% of the time I can't use it. But you know, every once in a while there might be a situation where it's appropriate or works for me. Right? Your kids are actually getting a cultural literacy if they know like this is bad for this situation, but it's okay for this situation. It's just things are just more public than they think. And that's where those pictures is like. So it's good that they know to hide them, but we also want to talk to them about the fact that they don't have to take them. Or, and, and I think we talk to our girls a lot more about that than boys. We want boys to know, A, you don't want to take those pictures of yourselves, because boys are doing it too, they're just not facing as big a social consequence. But also, it's not cool to walk around with pictures of girls. It's not okay. This is not the way to be a cool guy, right? So we also need to deconstruct that idea because some guys have this idea that this would be really cool, really, you know, macho or whatever. It's like, it's not cool. It's not the way to get respect from girls or women, right? And so just kind of, again, deconstructing that, you know, as we can with our kids over time having those conversations so that they can hear us and listening to them. Like, why do you think people do that? Rather than like, don't do this. Why do you think someone would do it? Right? Ask them that question. But yeah, the calculator thing was really freaking people out. There's always going to be some ways. I mean, the kids are always, in some sense, going to be ahead of us on that kind of stuff. You know, musically took a lot of parents by surprise too, which is this lip syncing karaoke app. A lot of young kids are on it, um, and that was that's the one where a lot of it, the default is to be public, and so a lot of adults were like, "Huh, little kids lip syncing." And again, most adults are not pedophiles. But if you are a pedophile and you think there's an app with little kids lip syncing and dancing, you might think this is really cool, right? And again, most people are not, right? It just, they, it's there. And that's, that's a hard thing. And you don't necessarily want to talk to your little kid about that so explicitly, but just to say you should only be friends with other kids or people in the family. That's enough, right? Yeah. I was just going to say I, I really appreciate all of the focus on the content and the apps and, um, and experts like you, I think, really educate all of us. I think the other thing, and I did mention this at our curriculum night, and you hit upon it with should the Chromebook be in the room or not. My, you know, my take on it was, you know, your, your kids didn't sleep with their social science book a year ago, so they probably don't need to sleep with their Chromebook. Right. Um, as well as, I get a unique experience in talking with kids when they're up in the office for a variety of reasons, and um, the, you know, I get talking about different things that they do on the computer and the amount of time kids spend watching a variety of things on YouTube. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I didn't realize, I'm such uh, whatever, uh, old lady. I didn't realize there's, you know, so many experts on just about everything. And I, I guess my advice, my concern for these kids when they're 50 years old and they think back to their teen years and their friends and their memories, they're going to be wrapped up in YouTube people that they never even met. Um, and so I think it's it's not only about the content and the the method of of tech, but just common sense of how much time. And if yeah. if you if we monitor the amount of time, um, I think that's critical because if, if a child's best friend is some YouTuber on uh, that you know, tells them about Minecraft. Um, I'm concerned about when they're much older and they reflect on their middle school years and who their best friend was, and that's going to be somebody they never met. That's what I'm concerned about our future with the youth of America, quite frankly. More, honestly, more so than some deviant person that's going to yeah. do something crazy. That's one in a million? No, distraction I'm, is like every, all of us, all of us. I mean, the, the flip side is you could say like if I was an introverted middle schooler and my best friend was a literary character or whatever, like there, there are ways for our kids to be connected with the content they see, but I agree with you that we don't want them to just get lost there. And you just also want to know, again, like what are they doing there? If they admire that gamer on YouTube, could they be contributing back to that community as well? And that's a question you have to ask yourself, like are you okay with your kid on YouTube? Channels. Some of your kids may be YouTube celebrities, but you would want to know that. If your middle schooler is famous, you want to know. And they may not be famous to you, but they might be famous to other kids who play the game they like or, you know, other things, which is, I mean, it's a super interesting possibility. 
Um, but a little overwhelming, right, the thought that our kids could be known sort of beyond their own circles. Because when we were kids, we were only known to the people in our family and on our block, right, in our school. I want to let people get home if you need to get to your kids and have dinner, but come say hi if you want. I'll be here for a little while. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Just the fact that you're here and you're paying attention to these things is so helpful to your kids. Go home and ask them some questions, not in a sense of like, what are you doing on there? But just like, what do you think about this? Or what, like, what do you think on YouTube? Do you think kids spend too much time on YouTube? Or what's the coolest thing that you've seen on YouTube? Right? Just have those conversations because you do want to know about their world. Thank you so much for coming out.